Trinitas Church, as we work through this passage, I'm not going to have so much points as four areas of reflection. Four distinct realms of reflection and thought about language and the God who rules and governs it. We begin with the concept as our first area of reflection that there is a language in reality that has no verbal words. It's a language that pervades everything and we live and we move and we have our being in this realm. In this realm of speech without words. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3, it opens this way. It tells us that the heavens themselves, that is, the visible heavens of the sun and the moon and the stars, are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the very work of his hands. This speech goes forth day to day. It actually pours forth like a mighty river. And night to night, it's revealing Genuine knowledge. But the curiosity comes to us in verse 3, where it would seem on the surface to contradict all that has been said in verses 1 through 2. We're told of this speech that it is in some sense no speech, and there are no words in it, and their voice is not heard. Here David, the psalmist, would have us know that this language is not like other languages. It's not a language where you can look up its words in the dictionary. It's not a language that comes to us by a verbal sort of hearing. But it's a language nonetheless. Therefore, it goes on in verse 4 that their line, that that is the whole measure of what they have said, has gone out throughout all the earth in their utterance, though it be not a verbal utterance to the very end of the world. What speech are we talking about here? You know, it's funny. uh, You've all heard this before. You've all heard that the greater part of your communication is nonverbal. You ever heard that before? I know you have. Some studies say as much as up to 93% of our communication is nonverbal. 55% body language, 38% is tone of voice. Why do you suppose this is the case? That most of what you're communicating isn't even happening with the words you speak. I'll tell you why. This psalm tells us why. It's because there is a language that precedes every human language. And let me tell you something about this language. Its very first word is God. God is always speaking to us. His voice is always instructing us and with infallible authority at that. It's actually an unspoken language that teaches us from the moment of conception to look for patterns, symbols, communication, meaning everywhere and always. You see, friends, before you can begin to learn a language, a human language, you have to have an unshakable certainty within you that there is language to be found. There are patterns to be discovered. There are communicators out there. The Bible tells us this is the very voice of God. This is the ineradicable, ineraceable knowledge of God. And guess what? Infants have it from the moment they're in the womb to the moment they come out looking for communication, knowing that they're made in the image of a communicator, knowing that this whole universe is God's communication and therefore looking for patterns, looking for regularity, looking for words. My friends, a verbal word is but a symbol that represents some generality in the world. A word can be something like mother, representing a generality, moms in general, throughout the world. Some of the first words that kids love to learn are animal names. It's at the top of the list. Your kids, you've got little kids, will go through the animal stage. Well, all they want to talk about is animals, identifying them, having figurines of them, and drawing them. This is because they've heard from the God of all communication. 
that in this world there are patterns and words to be found. It is a wonderful truth that this confidence that the whole universe is speaking to us cannot at first be learned from the world's speech. It is that which precedes the world's speech and makes it intelligible. It is because we're made in the image of God and David knows it. He speaks of it and he praises this general truth. What this means is that skeptical worldviews that call into the question the existence of God this universal communicator, these worldviews, they must be learned. They must be imposed upon us because they are not natural. One of the great philosophers of the modern period, a man by the name of Rene Descartes, he's famous for his concept of Cartesian skepticism, to not believe anything that you cannot prove with an indubitable rational proof. To doubt before we believe. You know what's funny about Rene Descartes is that baby Rene did not enter the world with Cartesian skepticism. When his mother aimed to feed him, he didn't say, You know, mom, how can I be certain that it's not poison that you're going to put in my mouth as opposed to nourishing milk? No one enters the world a Cartesian skeptic. We actually enter the world with an utter certainty. True and honest communication is to be found. I'd say this is a rather damning criticism of a worldview that aims to live by Cartesian skepticism, doubt before belief. Frankly, even Descartes has a certain hope and confidence that when he employs this method of Cartesian doubt, scrutinizing his beliefs, it will yield good results. And that confidence, that hope, it precedes the entire endeavor. The same is true of modern scientism. There are people who actually suppose that it is unwise to believe anything but what can be proven via scientific method. Scientific method involves developing a hypothesis that some particular cause has some correlation with certain effects and testing it with a control group where you have cause, the cause that you suspect that will give rise to a certain effect, and you have another group without that cause, and you attempt to prove a correlation between the two. Funny thing about every scientific experiment is that it always assumes much more than it tests. If you're doing it in a science experiment on anything, you are assuming much more than you're testing. You are assuming the integrity of the building in which you're doing that experiment. You are assuming all sorts of things about reality in the midst of it. This is because we are wired to and we must believe certain speech before we test any other speech. My point in all of this is that we are natural, naturally living as the image of God with every breath that we take. And we do so because of a language speaking to us at all times that's unlike any human language. Now, when we consider that, we might want to consider some of the most pervasive words that God has spoken to everybody. You know, there are great structures in our land that if you live in the Pacific Northwest, we can all assume you know what they are and you've seen them before. Maybe Mount Rainier. I remember when I went down to Florida, it was a frustrating place to be because it's flat as a pancake and you cannot see any natural, any sort of natural sizable monuments to tell you where you are. The only way you could know where you were is that there's like different stores in this strip mall as opposed to the one you saw like two miles back. Strange place, Florida. But here's the thing, even a mountain like Mount Rainier is only seen and known by a relatively small portion of the globe. If you were to ask yourself, what natural phenomena do everybody see? What speech from God does everyone in all time and all the globe get to see? You would be led to the heavens and the stars. These things are not like Mount Rainier. The stars, the sun, and the moon. Every human being who has had sight from the beginning of time to the present 
have seen these words. No matter where you are on the globe, you've seen this communication and consider it. It's beautiful. I have never in my entire life met someone who said, I hate the stars. They're so ugly. I've met people who are relatively indifferent to them because they've seen them so much, but I've never met anyone who despised their form. This speech that God has spoken to all people in every place is also, in addition to being beautiful, remarkably useful. You consider the sun. It is this life-giving orb up in the sky. Its sunrise wakes us up. Its sunset puts us to bed, and it gives life all over the globe. It's followed by the moon as a very welcome nightlight if you happen to be out in the dark. Look at this incredible speech. Trinitas Church, I think there's this tendency for mankind to look around whenever there is upheaval and feel as if everything is falling apart. God's speech to you and the sun and the moon and the stars says, no, sin is only found in this little dot called earth where little grasshopper people live, you and me. And in the greater cosmos, there are these phenomena that obey the voice of God and speak to us his normalizing influence on all things. The very worst of our wars, the very worst of our behaviors are against the stars like a grasshopper rebellion against a human populace. It's small and minute. We might look at the world and see tragedy. We might say not 80 years ago, there was World War II and every continent, every continent saw war. Friends, I don't mean to diminish how horrific some of the abuses of human life were in that time, but I want you to consider what an upheaval that was against the backdrop of a fixed order of the heavens that has not changed from the beginning of time and never will. I submit to you, it's a constant revelation from our great and kind God to tell us that this world is under his control. You might look around the world and be frustrated at the relative distribution of wealth, that some people have a lot more of it than others. You might even feel guilty that you have more of it than others. But let me tell you something. God has given all of mankind, without exception, the sun. And my goodness, what good news. This privilege has been given to all. And God frequently points to it as an indication of his broad, general, common grace and loving kindness. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 5, 44 to 45. But I say to you, love your enemies. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He gives this grand privilege to everyone. Friends, imagine if the sun were localized like Mount Rainier. That one country that had the sun would be under perpetual war at all times. (laughs) Because they have the one light that makes things grow. Everybody would be fighting for it. God in his grace has perfectly distributed it. God sometimes invites us to look at the world through the stars and the message that he has spoken in it. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says of God, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Put it in perspective, friends. The stars tell us that there is a reality much bigger than ourselves and this universal communicator through them to us must be even greater and bigger still. God often comforts us with the stars. He tells us this in Jeremiah 31, 35 to 36. Take this in. You worried about the church? 
Are you worried about her longevity in the earth? Are you worried about the people of God? Hear this. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. If this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. And what are we if not sons of Abraham? Because we share the faith of Abraham. God has spoken a message to mankind, everyone for all time through the heavens. He has revealed his mighty hand, his loving kindness, his wisdom. And it is unambiguous. I say this to you, especially if you have fear about upheaval of words and language. We can play games all day attempting to redefine this, redefine that, but the Lord is telling us my language will have sway. What I have spoken will define things. Man may rebel against it, but look at my words in the heavens. They run their courses. The Lord's word is going to subdue human rebellion. These things remain our fallacious languages, our ridiculous reasoning, they disappear with us. Let's turn to our second realm of reflection. If you're taking notes, this would be something like the second point of the sermon. We're going to talk about language and symbols. There is a remarkable thing that God has done with his creation that we take for granted so naturally, we never stop to consider it, but it's remarkable. God has made language in such a way that symbolism, deep symbolism can be expressed through it. And it didn't have to be that way. Specifically in verse four, it says this, in them, that is in the heavens, he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. It's rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat i want to tell you something about human poets what you just saw right there was an instance of symbolism the sun being described as a bridegroom when human poets engage in these sorts of verbal flourishes these wonderful connections between things consider what they're doing Out of the cleverness that God has given them, they are noticing an association of one reality with another reality. You might say that someone swims like a dolphin. You might say of a politician that his star is rising. You might say of a woman's beauty that it's like a dove. When human poets do this sort of a thing, they begin with one given reality and they associate it with another given reality, but the situation is radically different for God. No human poet creates the very symbol and the reality. He merely forges a connection between them. This is not the case with divine poetry. God did not look down on his creation and say, my goodness, well, I've got this son. Hey, wait, that's kind of like a bridegroom. That's kind of like my son, Jesus Christ. He didn't do that. Rather, God in his infinite wisdom said this, what can I create that could possibly serve to service as a symbol of my son? That is to say, God in his grand wisdom and divine design for creation to have his son incarnate, take on human flesh. In light of this eternal decree, said, what could I possibly make to service him as a symbol? If you don't understand what I'm saying, it's this simple, friends. What if I told you there is only one ultimate reason why the son exists One ultimate reason why it has these powerful, life-giving, heating, lightning properties. And that one reason is to serve as a symbol for Christ, the Son of God. Do you see the difference? God made this world in such a way 
that it could function as a symbolic language to tell us the gospel. When you really consider the son, boy, it sure is like a bridegroom. It describes him as leaving his tent chamber, probably in allusion to uh, ancient Hebrew wedding ceremonies where a bride and a bridegroom would be kept apart. You consider when a bridegroom would leave his chamber, what that would communicate to a bride when he would come out for the wedding. The person who came out would be a provider. The person who came out would be a leader. The person who came out would be a protector. My goodness, look at how the sun and its rise is like all of these things. When the sun rises every day as it is done from the beginning of creation, my goodness, do you see leadership in it? It is as if the sun personified has said, all right, you ready for yet another day's work? Follow me. I'll light the way. Every time that sun rises, it instills confidence in all of us. It says, don't worry, everybody. I'll do all the heavy lifting. I'll tell you what. I'll make everything grow. You just harvest it. I'll tell you what. I'll turn on the lights everywhere. You just do a little bit of labor in my light. Hey, everybody, I'll turn on the heat. I'll do it for everyone. You just build houses to stay warm in through the night. You kind of have to have missed the sun for a while to really appreciate just how mighty the work of the sun really is. I went on a hiking trip in high school through an organization called Young Life. Uh, it was called Beyond Malibu. You did seven days hiking in the Canadian coastals. And my goodness, can it rain up there? The first day of our hiking we went up about 3,000, 4,000 feet. We hiked all day and it, it was monsoon raining. It did not stop raining once. It was just sheets of rain all day. Everything we had was soaked. It was in bags. It was in all of these layers of plastic. I don't know how it got wet even below that. Everything was soaking. We got up the next morning. There was this thick mist everywhere. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. We hiked again all day long. Remember that second night, we slept on snow. And I remember I was like on a mound like this with my head down here, my feet down here, my body up here, and it was not pleasant. And good grief, I had to go to the bathroom all night, but I was not gonna get up and go out in the absolutely freezing, misty cold. It was a rough night. But when we woke up that morning, it is as if God blew with his mighty breath every single cloud out of the sky and we get up that morning to see a sunrise bright and beaming. I remember at that moment, I felt like saying I'd given up on you, son, but then you go and do this and totally redeem yourself. Renewal, life. Sun doesn't just lead, it doesn't just instill confidence, it beautifies everything beautiful you see. Is beautiful in its light. What an appropriate image for Jesus Christ. Before I go to consider that basic concept, that symbolism, it's an image for every husband, friends. If you are a husband here, you are to rise with leadership in your household. You are to instill confidence in every member of your household that they can work under the shadow of your wing. You're there to beautify your household and not least of which your bride. What an appropriate image. The sun exists to teach you about your duties. It exists to teach you about making things grow. You know, the sun tells us one thing, if nothing else, that the Lord sure does love consistency, even over big splashes. We live in a world where big splashes, big moments, big events can cover a multitude of sins if you can do something extravagant and wonderful. Many of us, if we're honest in our heart of hearts, we want nothing more than to be or to do something extravagant. Take a lesson from the sun. 
Its glory resides in the fact that it does the same darn thing every single day. And let me tell you something, dads and husbands, your family, more than they need a big splash, more than they need quick wealth, more than they need anything else, they need you to do the same darn thing every single day and to do it with gladness, to do it with confidence, and to do it with life-giving vigor. When you understand that, you can appreciate why it is that the sun is frequently used as a symbol to describe Christ and his work. In Malachi 4.2, when it speaks of the good news of the gospel, it says this, but as for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness, S-U-N, will rise with healing in its wings. And it's talking about the sun, S-O-N, of God who would take on human flesh. All of the Bible, in a certain respect, can be divided by the sun. Honestly, we're taught in scripture that the day begins in the evening with the dark. Midway through it, the sun rises and you get the day following the night. This is the whole story of the Bible. The Old Testament, as it were, begins in the evening. The entire Old Testament before Jesus Christ is, as it were, in the night. They're not without revelation. They had the good news of the stars and the moon. But my goodness, when Jesus Christ came and took on human flesh, it's like the day dawned. And you and me live in the day as opposed to the night. We live in the New Testament age where God's people have been more productive in proclaiming the gospel all over the globe than they were in the Old Testament. In fact, Paul loves Psalm 19. He describes gospel preaching like that line that stretches through the heavens as one message over the entire earth and says that's what our gospel preaching is like. Going out, covering the globe. Friends, my point is not that people could have looked at the sun and deduced that Christ would be coming or be like the sun, but my goodness, after Christ has come and we've lived in the light of the sun, my goodness, does it not become clear that the sun existed for no greater purpose than to serve and to function as an appropriate image for our Savior and King. We turn now to our third area of reflection. Maybe you're numbering points. That would be number three. It's language and its relationship to special revelation, actual verbal revelation. See, in verse 7, a a crazy turn takes place in this psalm, and it's kind of unexpected. We've been talking all about natural revelation, all about the stars, God's speech without words. And then in verse 7, like a lightning bolt, we read, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are altogether true. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of honeycomb. We have this remarkable change of topics, so it would seem, to our ears. But I'd have you know that it's more fundamentally one and the same. If you're a very close reader of the biblical text, you might have noticed a change of language. In the first six verses of this psalm, God is referred to by the generic word God, El or Elohim in the Hebrew. It's a word that denotes God's power. It literally means power. When speaking of general or natural revelation, all of mankind can infer and understand from that basic speech of God that there is a mighty power beyond all powers. But in this part of the book, or the chapter, the Lord's name is changed to Yahweh, or the Lord What it's telling us is God's personal name now. For those who know God in covenant with him, and those who know God in covenant with him, know him by, as it were, a first name, not a general name. It is the name that God gave himself in Exodus 3 when speaking from the bush, and it means I am. It was the glorious name by which God's people got to know him, and it was accompanied by the revelation of a law. 
there's a remarkable continuity between God's law and his revelation in the stars. This has been recognized not only by theologians, but by some of the greatest philosophers of all time. Immanuel Kant said this, Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The more often and steadily we reflect upon them. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. I do not seek or conjecture either of them as if they were veiled obscurities or extravagances beyond the horizon of my vision. I see them before me and connect them immediately with the consciousness of my existence. What he says is this, I am struck by these two mighty words at all times. The mighty word of the heavens and a cosmos that is so much bigger than me that that resides above me on which I'm dependent for my daily existence in the sun and the moon and the stars and all it does. And this other word, a moral law within me, telling me how to live and to act and convicting me. Kant got a few things wrong. He was quite a bit more optimistic about humanity's ability to obey this law within us. He was also too optimistic about how clearly we understand this law without God's written word. But there is something to be observed here. God has spoken with such mighty clarity in the natural creation and doubly so in his written word and especially in his law. Let me tell you how these two things work together. When we understand the grand grandeur of the heavens, we're naturally led to view this creation as a majestic ballroom. But the thing is, the ballroom itself can't tell us how to dance in it. God's law is, as it were, the prescription for how to dance a dance that is worthy of that context. You all get the idea if you were in some majestic Greek style pavilion that if all you did there was play Yahtzee, you would not be utilizing that room for all the grand activity it was meant for. God's law tells us how to live and to adorn this creation in a way that brings out its beauty as opposed to obscures it. These two things need each other. Special revelation and natural revelation were meant for each other. And so it is, God has given us his law. I'll tell you something, verse 10 is actually intuitive to most of mankind. It says that God's laws are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. Friends, I'm gonna tell you something. All of humanity is dying to find a purpose for how to live in this globe. They want purpose even more than they want the indulgence of pure pleasure. If you wonder why there's an appeal to falling into cult-like political ideologies, why there's an appeal to actual cult communities, why there's an appeal to street gangs, there's a reason, my friends. People want a purpose, a reason to live, and frankly, only, only God's law can tell us what we're meant for, can tell us what we're made for and how to conduct ourselves. I don't want to diminish for even a second the fact that there should be a good degree of moral grief, frustration, and even indignation when we see people rioting, surrounding other people, forcing them into gestures that they don't mean to gesture from their heart, but they're doing out of intimidation. We should have genuine frustration and anger that those things are occurring, but there should also be a measure of pity. Generations of youth are getting sucked into these ideologies because they have not been told the law of the living God. They don't have a purpose. So as soon as something comes along, that even seems to give the slightest degree of meaning to this life, they jump on it. But let us rejoice in God's word. David calls the law by six different names. First, he calls it the Torah. That doesn't just mean God's commandments. It's the first five books of Moses. 
And I'm going to tell you something right now. There is no other book in human history that tells us of our origins, tells us of where we got all of our problems from our inclination to sin, to the division of languages and peoples, to the fact to the fact that we live such short lives under the span of 120 years. This book sets our lives in a context where it can be made meaningful. He also calls it by the name, the testimony. Well, that particular word is a word used to speak of the 10 commandments some 20 times in Exodus. These two tables of the 10 commandments placed in the Ark of the Covenant, a testimony to the covenant relationship between God and man. And I'll tell you right now, you will never find a more complete and yet succinct summation of humanity's duty than in those 10 commandments. He also calls God's word by the name precepts. See, most of all, to be principles of positive approach to God seems to be an indication that God's word tells us, like no other book, how we can approach our maker and our savior. It is filled with commandments. All of it is one commandment, positive precepts about human behavior in a relationship to our fellow man especially. It calls the entire written scriptures the fear of the Lord. Why? Because it shows us a distinctive way to live every breath of our life in positive honor and fear of the creator who made us. It calls God's word by the name judgments. A judgment makes a distinction. Our God divides for us or sets before us two paths of right and wrong. I will tell you right now, you will never find a book so majestic and complete in all that it addresses and all that it speaks about who we are, what we are, where we're going and how we're gonna get there. What mighty revelation. But here's the thing. For as life-giving as it is to have such a revelation, as encouraging as it is, all of the descriptions that David gives it, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes, enduring forever, there's also this problem of which David was so aware and of which we are so aware. We've contradicted God's language, his words, in special revelation. How many of us daily forsakes God's judgments and distinctions? How many of us have failed throughout our lives to clearly distinguish and guard the difference between a girlfriend and a wife and how we relate to her? How many of us have failed throughout our lives to heed the distinction between worship and work, clearly having a regular time in a hebdominal cycle. That's a seven day cycle to worship God one day in seven. How many of us have blurred these distinctions between our income and our offering? How much of our world lives by false distinctions, defining all of reality in terms of white or black, liberal or conservative? How many of us really heed this law? The challenge before us is that David, like the rest of us, does not belong in the ballroom in a very obvious respect. These majestic heavens that house us, this sun that daily rises on us, warms us and feeds us, is better than what we deserve and frankly, it's contradictory to our disobedience to God. David speaks of this. He makes a transition in verse 11 when he says, moreover, by them, that's your law, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward, but we're warned because we're sinners who need a warning. Friends, we've committed flagrant sins. We have rebelled in a way that the sun and the moon and the stars never do. Listen to what David says for the remainder of the psalm. He says in verse 12, who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I will be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This takes us to our fourth area of reflection, friends. 
And it turns on this concept that we serve a God who is Lord over language. I want you to understand what David is praying for. David has admitted that he has secret sins, so secret, so deeply ingrained in who he is, he knows that he doesn't even know that he's doing them. We preached in the book of Leviticus how an entire offering, the sin offering, was designed to be an offering to give up to God as a sort of repentance for sins that escaped our notice. David says his problem is so deeply ingrained that he needs God to supernaturally keep him back from these sorts of things and presumptuous sins all the more. The fact is, we have all known the law of God and disobeyed it. But David prays for a different type of word than all the words that we've talked about so far. David prays for a word that is somehow true even though contrary to the reality of who he is. He says it this way. He says, acquit me of hidden faults. Do you know what that means? He says, declare me innocent of my very real hidden faults. He uses the language of a courtroom and he cries out to the God of language whose words are bigger than our reality to give me a word of justification, a word that though my enemy calls me wicked, though he calls me a lawbreaker, give me a word and call me righteous. This is an appeal to God as the Lord of language with whom all things are possible, who has the right to redefine and who always does it by the wonders of his justice just the same. I'll tell you this, David lived in the night as we saw earlier, unlike us who live in the day. We can understand what David was praying for even better than he did who prayed it. David was praying for what we understand as theologians as the doctrine of justification by faith alone. This concept hinges on the idea of a great exchange. God sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to bear the death that we deserve. God counted or imputed our sin to his own son that he might bear the penalty and the death that we deserve so that he might count or impute Christ's righteousness to us and give us a name that is contrary to what we are. But when coupled with God's mighty sanctification becomes prophetic of what we are destined to be. Many of us in the history of the world have said, my goodness, is that really allowed? Can such a change, an exchange of things be so allowed? Can God really call us righteous when the reality about us is to the contrary? And the answer, my friends, is absolutely he can. He's been doing it from the beginning. The only reason that we exist, that this ground exists and those stars exist, is because God spoke into nothing, even less than nothing. He spoke into what was not words, that there would be light, that there would be day and night. And that word preceded a reality, a total non-reality. And following that declaration, the reality did follow. So it is in our justification, God declares about you and I, sinners, less than nothing in ourselves, even contrary to the God who is. He declares us righteous on Christ's account alone. And he follows it with his mighty Holy Spirit and deep Union with Jesus Christ, whereby we are conformed to the word and the reality that he proclaims. Friends, if you've believed in Jesus Christ, God has placed your guilt on his son. He has given his son's righteousness to you. And that word is more true about you than any accusation that you've ever heard from another human being. Any accusation that you hear on a daily basis about perhaps the guilt of your race. Any accusation that you might hear from your own conscience. The righteousness of Christ intervenes like a wedge 
And it gives you a new identity and a new name because the Lord of language, he's not bound by your sin. He is mighty in his eternal and sovereign wisdom to change your very identity. David prays for just that acquittal before God. He prays that following that acquittal, God would even keep him back from presumptuous sins, that he would make him more like the Christ to come. David recognizes that throughout his life, he's still going to be a sinner until that great and final day. And he therefore prays even for his own prayer, knowing that our faults are so hidden in secret. He follows this whole prayer with saying, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Maybe my theology went wrong in this prayer. Maybe my motives went wrong in this prayer. Maybe even my requests were a little bit off. But Lord God, let me pray even for this prayer. Pray even for this worship. Cover it cover it. There's nothing more powerful, friends, than being told that our burden has been removed and being called by a name that we don't deserve. It actually inspires us to want to be more like the reality that has been declared. Take this into your relationship with your friends in this church and your children that you're raising in the Lord. My goodness, your kids need to hear it. After you've disciplined your kids, these kids who can talk and no doubt who parrot your profession of faith, tell them the reality of what that profession means. My goodness, you will have so many opportunities throughout the day, parents, to tell your kids what they've done wrong. They need to hear the good news, the word of acquittal, that in Christ they are perfect and righteous in their Savior in whom they believed. We need to speak this to one another. We need to speak the identity we have in Jesus Christ to one another. We're all guilt-ridden right now or about to be guilt-ridden tomorrow or we were yesterday. We've already been there. We're going there. We're always going to be dealing with it because we're sinners. We need to know in Jesus Christ our God is well-pleased with us. There's going to be opportunity this fall for fellowship, gathering together, prayer, reflection, you name it. I've sent out the worship email at this last Friday. Look it over. Figure out if you can have fellowship with one another. Maybe not even every week, but you could commit to once a month or you could commit to twice a month, something like that. Because you're not going to hear this word of acquittal and forgiveness from the Lord of language, from your boss. You're not going to hear it by and large from your coworkers and maybe not your neighbors, maybe not even those people who have historically been your friends. You're only going to hear it from other believers in Jesus Christ. If you've never believed in Jesus Christ before, believe, believe it or not, we think that the moment you do, Though you've been unrighteous in every imaginable way throughout your life, that very moment, you'll be declared completely righteous in the court of the eternal God. I do hope you will find him. I do hope you will cast yourself upon him. Let's bow your heads with me. Mighty God, what an awesome God you are in your works of wonder throughout the creation and the beautiful way that you have made all things do service to the Son, Jesus Christ, and the beautiful way that you have adorned language so that deep and powerful symbolism can take place. Mighty God, you are awesome and wonderful in revealing a law that is so holy and so pure and lifts up the soul because it gives us meaning and purpose, and you're even the more awesome in that sinners can rejoice in your law as not condemning us because we've been acquitted in full by Jesus Christ, our Savior, and your lordship over language. May we leave this place, Lord God, in the freedom of Christ. May we leave this place, Lord God, inspired the more to love and to follow after our Lord Lord Jesus Christ. May we leave with the prayer of David. And may our prayer, in spite of all of the confusion 
in our hearts when we pray it, may it be acceptable in your sight. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to take an offering, friends. If you're wondering how to give, uh, we'll have a deacon go around with uh, an offering uh, bag or some <laughs> pocket. Uh, that's weird. Um, you can also give online. You can also give via our church app. So if you have any questions for us about that, please talk with us after the service. But let's continue worshiping the Lord God, giving back to him what he has given to us. the story of my life You go before you fall behind Before breath beyond my death You are with me all the way to everlasting I can run and I can't hide Even darkness is a light From the lowest place to the highest praise You are worthy Amazing love, how can it be? Far too wonderful for me There is only one thing left to say you are worthy. Search me, God, and know my heart. Hey, let's all stand. Try me, know my anxious thoughts. Find no weakness in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I can't run and I can't hide. Even darkness sees a light from the lowest place to the highest praise. and bones how wonderfully made oh I can't describe it's way too hard you see me through and through and call me love what a wonderful grace well, you born me in my mother's womb. You know my frame, my flesh, and bones. How wonderfully made. Oh, I can't describe its way too hard. You see me through and through and call me love. What a wonderful grace. can't hide even darkness sees a light from the lowest place to the highest praise you are worthy amazing love how can it be far too wonderful for me there is only one thing left to say you are
Please be seated. Trinitas Church, we are about to go into this grand family meal that we have with our Savior. There could never be a greater indication that we are indeed forgiven in Jesus Christ, that we have the status of sons having been adopted into the household of God than, than that we have a seat at his table. That's what this meal is about. That's what this sacrament is about. It's about indulging the reality that the Lord of language has declared us righteous. And he's done so on account of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's go to this table in prayer, asking for the very things promised in it. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, what thanks we have for you and the mighty work that you've done in your son, Jesus Christ, giving us a status, giving it to us truly and yet remarkably and counterintuitively to the way that we are taught to think. Lord, we confess that we tend to view this world as governed by laws of its own as an impediment to the purposes of your kingdom. And yet in your son, Jesus Christ, you have shown that you have all sovereignty and that you can truly and powerfully call us holy, call us righteous when we have no desert to that title or name in ourselves. Praise you. God, we've already come confessing our sin, how difficult it is for us to believe this. Lord, we've already come confessing our weakness and the need for illumination when it comes to reading and understanding your word. Now, Lord God, we pray for communion with you. We pray for that son in whom we have redemption to dwell more richly in us. May he be to us our very nourishment. May he indeed be the son of righteousness who causes all things to grow and causes us to bear fruits of your spirit. We pray for these things. We also lift up to you, Lord, King of Kings, the many of our brothers and sisters who are in distress. We lift up to you, Lord King, those who have experienced great loss, those who are experiencing great, great pains and difficulties in their relationships. God, we pray for those who are not able to be with us because they are sick. We pray for many of the elderly who are not able to be with us on account of assisted living centers that affords them very little freedom. God, we pray and we lift up to you those brothers and sisters whom we haven't seen for months. God, we lift up to you Marsha McKelvey, a caretaker herself. God, we lift up to you Michael Chaplin and Crescent. God, we lift up to you Norman. God, we lift up to you Harry and Debbie. God, we lift up to you all of the others, we pray that they would be with us in spirit, that they would be nourished with us in spirit. In Jesus' name, by your Holy Spirit, amen. amen. As we go to the table, let's rise to our feet and confess what we believe. Trinitas Church, what is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace unto sinners in which he pardoneth all their sins accepteth and accounteth their persons righteous in his sight, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed to them and received by faith alone. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. And after having given thanks, as we've done in his name, he gave it to the disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. If you've never believed in Christ, you've not been baptized into Christ, you're not a member of his church, refrain from this meal. This is for those who have first and foremost received Christ in saving faith unto their justification. But brothers and sisters, if that is you, you believed on Jesus Christ, you've been baptized, you confess him as Lord, come, come asking for everything he promised in it. With that said, let's take the bread. This is Christ's body, which is given for you. In the same way, let's take the cup. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Trinitas Church, let us go with one more prayer that this world that is in darkness would know and experience the forgiveness that we have. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, we never tire at celebrating the gospel. It is to us, our great peace, our great assurance of salvation. It's the life in which we live. God, we pray that this world that is trapped in darkness, that is given to every fleeting philosophy, that attempts to identify itself in its meaning, in worldly ideologies, God, a world that is often simply broken with no sense about how to live or where to go, maybe even riddled with guilt that cannot be taken away. We pray that this world would be set free in Jesus Christ. God, we pray for our land. We pray for the Pacific Northwest. We pray for our region in Western Washington. God, we pray for all of the churches round about us that the gospel would be faithfully preached and believed unto salvation. Holy God, this is our plea this we beg you, Lord, because we have unbelieving family members, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, neighbors and friends. God, we pray for their salvation and we pray for a boldness to speak of you when the time comes. Mighty God, knit us together in love so that we can indeed be a harbor, that we can indeed be a place a comfort and peace and still waters from those who've been crashed and turned by the world like crashing waves. God, we lift up to you as well, our missionaries all over the globe. We lift up to you the countless men and women whose names we do not know, who suffer persecution in lands where the gospel, where the gospel is under the threat of legal pen penalty should it be preached. Lord God, protect John and Katie in Bangladesh. God, we pray as well for our brothers and sisters in China. God, we lift up to you the many who have been martyred in Africa for their Christian faith, but whom we would never know existed from our news outlets, the numbers of which dwarf, Dwarf those who have been unjustly killed in our own land. God, we pray for their protection and we pray that their blood would cry out more powerfully than our prayers for your vindication of your name. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Mighty Lord, extend your kingdom, be the truth with triumph crown. Let the lands that sit in darkness hear the glorious gospel 
with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. If you'll just be seated for a moment, I'll pass on some basic announcements. We are headed into uh, the traditional season in which Trinitas has more regular classes, small groups, and the like. We're doing a lot of new things this year. Uh, first, I just I really want to double down on this. If you've got teenage kids, we are embarking on a season of youth discipleship. Once a month, we're going to have a regular youth discipleship meeting. It's going to be the third Sunday of the month, so there's no traffic in terms of driving kids around, and it's going to be in the evening. And um, location TBD because, well, we're meeting tonight as a core team to figure out where we want to meet. We've got plenty of viable options. It's just a matter of where. But we're also going to have youth events that supplement that, opportunities for fellowship and fun and uh, getting together, getting to know your peers in Christ. Additionally, we've got small groups, one on the north end that the Kaminsky's and uh, Zach and Tiffany Wetzel are going to be heading up. If you live northward, Okay, so that's, you're in the, the north end of the Snohomish County end of things. Please find, find Zach or the Kaminsky's. They're somewhere around here too. Find out more about the group. The info is in all of the emails that I will be sending forth, henceforth, um, the worship emails, and figure out if you can make it out on a Tuesday night twice a month at 630 to do sermon reflection. Word has it, Zach Tate takes incredible sermon notes. <laughs> that are even more incredible when I clearly indicate what point I'm on. So we're working on both of those things and it's going to make for even better sermon discussion. But please figure out, maybe you can show up once a month. Maybe you can show up all the time. But consider these groups. Feral groups still going strong every Thursday night. We've got a women's study on there as well. And of course, if you'd like to get down and dirty, do a little bit of reading and learn about some church history going back to the Reformation to the present, show up at the Bosserman House at 6 p.m. on the 
second and fourth Sunday of the month, all right? All of that being said, the Lord bless you and keep you, and you guys have a great Lord's Day. Get some rest, and let's gear up for the fall.